In section 2.2, we're going to be taking a look at uh, all the basic differentiation rules that you're going to need to know. Uh, but most importantly, we're going to leave behind this long definition of the derivative that involves a limit and a lot of steps. It's going to be a nice shortcut for doing all those problems from 2.1 uh, that we looked at. So the first thing we need to go over is a really big topic that usually throws off a lot of students, and that's the notation we use when we're talking about derivatives. Uh, it would be nice if there was just one way to do it all the time, but there's several ways we gonna have to, we're going to have to look at the notation for derivatives. Uh, the first you already know about, we saw it in 2.1, f prime of x. If you ever see f prime of x, you should know we're talking about a derivative or slope. Uh, the other way we can write the notation for a derivative is just like um, functions having two notations, f of x and y, we can also write a derivative as y prime. Again, same thing as f prime, and it's the same thing as slope. The one that seems to throw off a lot of students is what is called Leibniz notation. Um, it's written as a dy over dx, uh, a change in y divided by a change in x, or in other words, slope. So the notation makes sense. We have a change of y over change of x, which you know to be slope, which is a derivative. Um, if you're going to say Leibniz notation, when you say dy dx, we're talking about the derivative of a function y with respect to its variable x. So a few things you have to be careful with. When you see dy dx, it is the same thing as f prime, and it is the same thing as y prime. dy dx is a noun. It's telling you that you have a derivative. A derivative has been taken, and whatever it's equal to, that is the derivative, just like f prime, just like y prime. Uh, it does not mean some dy thing divided by dx. It does not mean d times y in the top, and it doesn't mean d d times x in the bottom. It's just a complete notation uh, that stands for a derivative. So be careful. It's not a fraction, uh, and it's not indicating multiplication. A little bit different notation. Uh, you'll notice that in this notation, we don't have a y in the top with the d, um, and then there's a function off to the side of the fraction. Uh, when you see this notation, it's telling you to take a derivative of a function. Uh, eventually, there will be a function written right here, but for now, it's just f of x. This is telling you to take the derivative of the function with respect to the variable x. So it's a verb. Unlike dy dx, which is a noun, it's a thing, it's a derivative, uh, this is an action. It's asking you to take the derivative of the function f of x with respect to the variable x. And again, it doesn't mean multiplication, it doesn't mean division, it's just notation uh, trying to tell you something without writing out the long word uh, sentence um, using math notation instead. So we're going to go over a few of the basic rules here. Uh, the constant rule. The derivative of a constant is zero. Now, I guess that's something you can just attempt to memorize, or you can also think about the concept behind why the derivative of a constant is zero. And notice the notation. This is telling you to take the derivative of a constant c with respect to x. So why is the derivative of a constant with respect to x equal to zero? Well, just remember what a derivative is. The derivative is slope. If you graph a constant, that's just a horizontal line. And we know the slope of a horizontal line is zero. So it makes sense that the derivative of a constant is equal to zero, always. It doesn't matter what the number is. If you take the derivative of 27, you'll get zero. If you take the derivative of a billion, you'll get zero. So derivative of a constant zero, just something you can memorize, but I hope you remember the concept behind that. Uh, the constant multiple rule. It turns out we can pull out constants or maybe ignore constants in a way when we're taking derivatives. If you have a constant times a function, you'll notice that when you take the derivative of x, you're going to end up with f prime of x. On the outside of that is the constant that you multiply by. So you can kind of ignore the constant, so to speak, take the derivative of the function, and then it, uh, multiply by that constant. 
Next we have the sum difference rule. It turns out if you take two functions and add or subtract them and you try to take their derivative, we can uh, split that into two pieces. We can take the derivative of the f function and then add that to the derivative of the g function. So basically look at this as a way to split up your problems. If we have multiple functions being added or subtracted, we can just take the derivative of each of those individually and then add or subtract those depending on the signs that are being used. So what we want to try to do is answer this question. Is there some sort of hidden structure or pattern to derivatives? If so, maybe there's a shortcut in doing the problems like we did in 2.1 with the long limit process. Um, so I'm going to give you some functions and their derivatives, and we're going to see if we can find a pattern looking at the powers, exponents, or the co and the coefficients, uh, the numbers in front of the variable. So let's take a look at the function 2x squared and its derivative f prime uh, equals 4x. Remember, that is slope. So let's focus on the powers first. Um, you'll notice that the power in the function has, is a 2. Uh, the power in the derivative is a 1. So it seems like we've gone down by 1 in the power. Uh, what about the coefficients? Well, the coefficient for the function is 2. The coefficient for the derivative is 4. So how would we have gotten 4? Well, maybe we added the power to the coefficient. 2 plus 2 is 4. Maybe we multiplied the coefficient and the power. 2 times 2 is 4. Uh, it's a little hard to tell, but at least we kind of see that the power went down by 1. In this second example, uh, p, and side note, um, our functions don't have to always be x. I know you get used to seeing x's all the time in your functions, but you know from time to time we'll see t's in different variables, so just to get you used to that. We have another function, p, um, and it's equal to t squared plus t, and its derivative is 2t plus 1. So again, let's focus on the powers for a moment. In the function, the first term has a 2. In the derivative, the first term has a power of 1. So again, seems like it went down by 1. In the function, we have an invisible coefficient here. That's a 1. And then the coefficient in the derivative became a 2. So it definitely doesn't look like we are adding the coefficient to the power. That would be a 3. So maybe we are multiplying the coefficient of the power. Let's take a look at the second term. In the second term, uh, the power is 1. The exponent is 1. In the derivative, there is no t. Unless you realize that there really is a t there, except its power is a 0. So again, you'll notice the power did reduce by 1. What about the coefficient? Well, the coefficient, again, is this invisible 1 for the function. It doesn't seem like we're adding the power and the coefficient because that would be 2 in this case. In our derivative, we see a 1, so maybe we're multiplying the coefficient and the power. Let's take a look at one last example. Uh, we have a function and its derivative again. Uh, if you notice in the first term, we have a power of 2. In the first term of the derivative, we have a power of 1. So I think we're getting pretty comfortable in saying the power is reducing by 1. What about the coefficient? Well, we're going from a 5 to a 10. Again, we can't be adding the power and the coefficient, or that would be a 7 in this case. So I think we're getting a little comfortable, hopefully, in saying we're taking the power and multiplying it by the um, coefficient. Let's take a look at the second term. Second term has a power of 1. Again, it has an invisible coefficient of 1. Uh, if we look at the second term of the derivative, it has no x. Again, unless you realize that would be x to the 0th power. So again, it looks like our power is reducing by 1, 1 to 0. And then the coefficient and the power seem to be multiplied to get that 1 in front of that x to the 0th power. In the last term, of our function, we have just a constant 3. And again, there is no x term, but we know there's an invisible x term, so to speak, x to the 0th power. You'll notice in the derivative, there is nothing over here. And I think that kind of solidifies why we're multiplying the coefficient and the power. It seems like we're multiplying the coefficient and the power because if we do that in this case, 3 times 0 would be 0. And then that's, of course, why we have nothing there. So instead of looking at this pattern now, hopefully this kind of gave you a way to see what we're about to get to, and it's the shortcut. Uh, but it seems 
like what we're doing here is um, a bit of a pattern and there is a pattern and that pattern is we're going to take the coefficient and multiply that by the original exponent in the function and then subtract one from that exponent and that gives us what is called the power rule what the power rule says is we take the power and we multiply it to the coefficient again there's this invisible one here if we take the power and multiply it by the coefficient one times n is n and then we take that power and subtract one away from it which is why the power is n minus one okay so let's try using the power rule and first example here will hopefully illustrate the power of the power rule so let's suppose I want to take the derivative of x to the hundredth power but we didn't know there was a pattern or maybe this shortcut called the power rule well if we had to find the derivative of x to the hundredth power and all we had was 2.1 where we learned the definition of the derivative with this limit process uh, we would have a very large problem on our hands uh, we would end up with x plus delta x remember as a quick review this right here is telling you to plug in x plus delta x for x. So we're going to end up with x plus delta x to the hundredth power minus f of x, which is x to the hundred over delta x. So where would we go from here? Well, back in 2.1, if this was x plus delta x squared, we would have foiled that out. So I'm going to kind of pull out an x plus delta x squared from that hundred of them, which would, of course, leave 98 of them still left. Well, luckily this we know how to do. The squared part of that uh, we've multiplied out back from 2.1, which is um, what you see below. But we still have x plus delta x to the 98th power. We would have to FOIL that out a lot more times and then multiply out all those terms together. It would be a gigantic problem, a problem that I'm not even sure would be even reasonable to ever finish. So that, that, that. That, that. that is not the way we're going to attempt to do uh, derivatives. Uh, so let's see how powerful the power rule is. Uh, let's use the power rule to take the derivative of x to the hundredth power. Uh, the power rule says we need to take that co I'm sorry, that exponent and multiply it to the coefficient in the front. Uh, again, there's this invisible coefficient of a 1 right here. So 100 times 1 is 100. We have our x, the variable still. And then we take the exponent, the power, and reduce it by 1. In this case, 100 minus 1 is 99. So it turns out the derivative of x to the 100th power is 100x to the 99, which you could have found by doing the definition of the derivative here, but that would have basically taken forever. So hopefully that illustrates the power of this power rule, which is why we're going to always use it instead of the definition of the derivative, unless we're forced into doing it that way. Um, so take a big, big note. The power rule can be used only when you see what I'll call a plane x to a power, not some sort of polynomial to a power. Um, this problem right here requires a little bit different process uh, to do. So if it's just a plain x to a power, we can use the power rule. If it's a, some other stuff in parentheses to a power, unfortunately the power rule uh, won't work. We'll see how to do that a bit later. So let's take a look at some of the simplest derivatives and get into some of the complicated ones into the next slide. Uh, the derivative of a constant function is zero. We saw that already, so just a quick review of that. The, de the derivative of a linear function is a constant. Why is that the case? Well, if you have the function f of x equals 3x, you can see the derivative is equal to 3. You just have to remember f of x is another way of, f, sorry, f prime of x is just another way of asking for slope. We know that this is in the form y equals mx plus b. And we see that our slope in this case is 3. So a couple of the simplest derivatives. The derivative of a constant is 0. And if you have a linear function like 3x, 4x, 5x, what have you, uh, its derivative is just that constant in the front. 
Okay, so let's take a look at some more examples here. So we want to find the derivative of y equals 16 plus x cubed. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to take advantage of two properties, the power rule and the constant multiple rule. You'll notice we have a 16 in front of the x cubed. So we can kind of pull that out to the front, so to speak. We can ignore it and just take the derivative of what we know how to take the derivative of now with the power rule, x cubed. So, a few things you'll notice in this next step, especially notation. Our original function is y equals 16x cubed, and now that we're finding the derivative, or we're writing the derivative, we need to change that to y prime to indicate that that is a derivative. And now you'll notice the 16 is sitting out in the front, and we're going to take the derivative of x cubed using the power rule. Uh, so how do we take the derivative of x cubed using the power rule? Well, well the power rule says, Take the power and bring it out to the front of the x. And then take that x and reduce its power by 1. Of course, we could have just multiplied the 16 and the 3 right away, but I kind of want to break these problems down since we're just starting to take a look at these. Um, so you could have done this in one step. Uh, 16 times 3 is 48. x to the second power when you reduce the power by 1. And again, remember, this is our slope machine. It's the thing that will give us a slope if we plug in an x. And the notation for the derivative, again, being y prime. In this example, a little bit different. We have a fraction. So how does that change the problem, if any? Well, there's one big idea that we're going to have to keep in mind every single time we take a derivative. And that is, is our function in what I like to call derivative friendly form. Derivative friendly form is like this first example that you see right here. It's a number times an x to a power. If you see a number times an x to a power, you're good to go. You're in what I call derivative friendly form and you can take the derivative like I did in the first example. So how do we make this fraction into a derivative friendly form? Well, luckily, since there's no addition or subtraction in the numerator or the denominator, we can split up this fraction. We can take the 4 over 5 and make that the number in the front of an x cubed, which is great because we have what is derivative friendly. I have a number, I have an x, and I have a power, which is exactly what we need for derivative friendly. So just like you saw in the first example, we're going to apply the power rule. Uh, one little side note, if you like to write your fractions with a slash, I'll ask you to stop doing that if you can. Um, the best way to write fractions, just because it will avoid confusion, is to write them as a number over a number with a horizontal line. You can still write them with a slash, but you can kind of get into some trouble with the way your handwriting might uh, show that slash. So if you want to avoid all that, I think the best way would be to write it as a number over a number. So back to the problem. Um, what we need to do here is apply the power rule. But we're going to keep that four-fifths out in the front. Again, that constant multiple rule says we can leave that constant in the front and then take the derivative of that x cubed, which we already did in that first example. Again, please be careful with the notation. Our original function is f. Our derivative, our slope machine, is f prime. Uh, to simplify this, uh, if you recall, we can multiply these two numbers here. Uh, to combine that into one fraction, uh, which will give us 12 over 5 x squared. And again, that is our slope machine, that's our derivative. This problem seems to be much different than the first two. Um, we have a fraction where the x is in the bottom of it, and that's not a problem. Uh, again, the one thing you have to keep in mind is we're looking for derivative friendly. A number, an x to a power. So, you're going to have to remember a little property of exponents back from your algebra days. Um, and here's a quick little review of it. If you have an x to a power in the bottom of a fraction, if need be, you can move it to the top of a fraction just by simply changing its power to an opposite sign. So, if you have 1 over x to the fourth in the bottom of a fraction, you can move that to the top as x to the negative 4. And since we're looking for what I call derivative friendly, we definitely want to do that. If we take that x to the fourth from the bottom and move it to the top as x to the negative four, we've achieved what I call derivative friendly. You have a number, you have an x, 
and you have a power. If you have a number times an x to a power, we can apply the power rule. And again, I'm going to leave that 5, that constant of 5 out in the front, and then apply the power rule. The power rule says bring the coefficient, I'm sorry, the exponent to the front of the uh, x, and then reduce that power by 1. So just like the previous two examples, we're going to, of course, multiply the 5 and the negative 4 to be negative 20, and the x is going to be to a power of negative 5. Negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5, and that is a perfectly acceptable answer. Uh, unfortunately, though, sometimes uh, answers are simplified, and it might not look like that if you're dealing with a multiple choice problem. So just realize um, we can revert that negative power of 5 back to a positive power, but we have to make a fraction. We can move that x to the negative 5 to a bottom of a fraction, but we have to change the power to a positive. So both of those answers are acceptable, just depends on the problem you're looking at. The last example we have to look at is a very conceptual problem. It's very different from the top half of the slide, but no more different or no more difficult than the first half or these first few examples. So what is this problem asking us to do? All we have is this limit of a fraction equals to a question mark. But what you should notice right away from 2.1 is it looks an awful lot like our definition of a derivative. It looks an awful lot like that formula that we used back in 2.1. Uh, we have an f times an x plus delta, uh, I'm sorry, x times h, all to the eighth power. And then we have the most important part. You'll notice that this thing is not asking you to take a limit, or we're not going to take a limit. This problem, we're actually just going to find the derivative. So a lot of the times on the AP test, there's going to be problems that are going to be more difficult than they seem, but are actually very simple and straightforward. You just have to understand the notation to kind of dig through that. So you'll notice the definition of the, deri of the derivative has our function in that last spot in the top of the fraction. So we know the function in this particular problem is 8x to the 8th. And since this notation that we see in the problem is really just asking us to find the derivative, we can really just take the derivative of our function, 8x to the 8th. And since we now know a shortcut, we don't have to worry about doing it the long way. We can apply our new power rule and make this problem a lot simpler. So just like the previous problems, we're looking for derivative friendly, which is a, a number, an x, and then a power. And we have that. So we're going to take the 8 as the coefficient, leave it in the front, bring down the power of 8 to the front of the x, then reduce that power by 1. Again, I'm kind of showing every step in these problems, but for a lot of you, you can skip this step because, of course, you can do 8 times 8, which is 64, and then we can reduce the power of 8 by 1, which is 7. So the derivative f prime of x is equal to 64 x to the 7th a lot quicker than doing this problem like we could have done, like we did back in 2.1. Okay, continuing on with a few more examples, a little more difficult. Uh, right off the bat, you're going to have to recognize this notation here. This d dx is telling you to take a derivative. It's telling you to take a derivative of a function, and in this case, our function is 2 square root of x. So how are we going to do that? Well, again, keep in mind, derivative-friendly form. We want a number times an x to a power. Uh, so we have an x, but it doesn't have a power, unless you recall this little fact uh, back from your algebra days. If you want to change a square root to a power, we can't. Uh, a regular square root becomes a one-half power. Uh, a cubic root would become a one-third power. A fourth root become, would become a one-fourth power, and so on. So we can change this expression to 2x to the one-half power. And again, you'll notice I'm still keeping the d dx notation because I haven't taken a derivative yet. All I did from step one to step two was rewrite it in derivative-friendly form. Now that we're in derivative-friendly form, we can take the derivative just like the last slide, or like the problems in the last slide. I'm going to leave the 2 in the front, bring the power of 1 half down to the front of the x, and then reduce the power by 1. If we simplify this, 2 times a half would be a 1, it's an invisible 1 in front of the x, and then we're going to reduce the power by 1, which will give us a negative half. A perfectly acceptable answer again, 
but it may or may not match multiple choice answers from time to time. So just realize we can change x to the negative 1 half to 1 over x to the 1 half power. If we change that to 1 over x to the 1 half power, we can write that as 1 over the square root of x. So actually, all three of these are acceptable. Um, it just depends on the way you want to write your answer and if it needs to be completely simplified. In this next example, it looks a little more difficult, but again, the same goal remains. We want to find the derivative. This is the notation here for finding the derivative. We haven't taken the derivative yet. And uh, our goal is, again, to make this derivative friendly. So how do we do that? Well, we need a number times an x to a power. This one seems to be a little more difficult, um, but let's break it down piece by piece. This x at the bottom, we can change to just have an exponent without a root anymore. Um, the way we can change this is to make it x to the 2 over 3, x to the 2 thirds power. So if I rewrite that as x to the 2 thirds power, I can take that to the top of our fraction, which would make it x to the negative 2 thirds power. We're going to have 1 half in the front. This is our 1 half right here, in case you don't see it. I'll circle it for you. That 1 half is the 1 half I circled. And then we're going to take the x to the 2 thirds in the bottom and move it to the top as a negative 2 thirds. Now we've again achieved what I call derivative friendly, a number, an x, and then a power. So let's take the derivative. How are we going to leave the 1 half in the front? Bring the power of negative 2 thirds to the front of the x and reduce the power by 1. If we simplify the two fractions being multiplied in the front, we'll get negative 1 third. And when we reduce negative 2 thirds by 1, we'll get negative 5 over 3. This one I won't simplify any further. The last example is going to illustrate the use of what we saw before called the sum difference rule. All the examples up until now have been just one single term. This problem has three different terms or three different functions being added or subtracted. So in this case, we're going to use that sum difference rule. Or in other words, we're just going to take the derivative of each term separately, which is great. We don't really have to change this problem much. And again, I'll reiterate the notation of d dx means take the derivative of this function that you see here. So we need to take the derivative of each of these functions. And I'm just going to color code these with the red and the blue so you can see here. OK, so let's take the derivative of the first term, 2x cubed. I'm going to leave the 2 in the front, bring the 3 to the front of the x, the power of 3 to the front of the x, and reduce the power by 1. For the second term, I'm going to leave the 6 in the front, bring the power of 2 to the front of the x, reduce the power by 1 again. And for the last term, same deal. I'm going to leave the 1 coefficient in the front, bring the 1 power down to the front of the x, and reduce the power by 1. Of course, we need to clean this up and make it look a lot more simplified. 3 times 2 is 6, and we'll have x squared. Two 6 times 2 is 12, and then we'll have x to the first power. And then this last term all becomes just a simple number 1. All of that is what is equal to our derivative, f prime of x, or yet again, our slope machine. So now let's take a look at finding the derivative of a few trick functions. Uh, we're just going to focus, focus on the derivatives of sine and cosine. Uh, we'll take a look at other trick functions a little bit later. So it turns out that when you take the derivative, again, note the notation, when you take the derivative of sine, that's equal to cosine. When you take the derivative of cosine, that's equal to negative sine. Uh, we'll get into a later um, section further on down the road as to why these are both true. Uh, but for now, we'll just practice on using them. So the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. One big note to make. We can only use these two formulas if you see what I call a plain x. If it's just sine x, then it's equal to cosine x. If it's just the derivative of cosine x, then that's equal to negative sine x. These two don't work if it's, say, for example, sine of 2x, or sine of x squared, or cosine of 2x, or cosine of x squared. So keep that in mind. These two only work if you see a plain x. 
So let's take a look at the first example. Um, we want to find the derivative of sine x over 2. So how are we going to take this derivative? Well, we still need to make it derivative friendly in a way. I need to see a number times a function so I can use that constant multiple rule. We know the derivative of sine is cosine, so I just need to see a constant in front of that, and I think we'll be okay. So we can rewrite sine x over 2 as 1 half sine x. Remember, sine x is its own function. This all goes together, and that's being divided by 2, or conversely, it's being multiplied by 1 half. So how do we take this derivative? Well, we have a constant in the front of sine, and that's okay. We can leave that constant out in the front, and then just multiply by the derivative of the function sine x. We know from above the derivative of sine is cosine, so the derivative of 1 half sine x is 1 half cosine x. Again, the notation f prime of x means that's our derivative or our slope machine. What about the problem pi over 2 sine x minus cosine x? Well, in this first term we have here, we have, again, a number times the function sine x, just like we saw above after we rewrote it. And then we're subtracting cosine x. So we can use a few different rules here. The sum difference rule will let us do both of these derivatives separately. And then we can use the constant multiple rule to leave the pi over 2 in front of the sine x. So let's go ahead and do that. To find the derivative of y, which is y prime, we're going to leave the pi over 2 in front of the sine x. And the derivative of sine is cosine, just like you saw above. Next, we have the derivative of cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, but we've got to be careful. We're subtracting cosine, and since the derivative of cosine is a negative sine, we're going to have the, a negative and then another negative, which of course we can simplify to be a positive. In this last example, you're going to have to remember some concepts because we're being asked to find the slope of the graph for sine x minus x at the point zero, 0. As soon as you see that word slope, you should be thinking derivative. We need to find the derivative of f, which is of course f prime. Since we have two functions being added or subtracted, again, you can see our two functions here. This is one, this is two. Uh, the derivative of 4 sine x, again, we use that constant multiple rule to leave the 4 in the front. 4 sine x becomes 4 cosine x. The derivative of x, which is a linear function, the derivative of x is just 1. The reason is because we have an invisible 1 in the front. The derivative of x is 1, just like the derivative of 2x is 2, or the derivative of 3x is 3. So this is, again, that thing that I like to call a slope-producing machine. If you feed this function, this derivative, an x value, it spits out a slope. And that's exactly what we want. We want to find the slope of the graph at the point 0, comma 0. So I need to feed this machine, this slope machine, an x value. And we want to find the slope at the x value of 0. This is our x. This is our y. So what is this notation right here saying? Well, exactly that. I want to find the derivative. I want to find the slope at 0, at the x value 0. If you plug in 0 for x, cosine of 0 is 1. 4 times 1 is 4. Minus 1 is 3. So we know the derivative at 0, or the slope at 0, is equal to 3. In this example, we're going to hopefully take advantage of our newfound power rule uh, to make a problem like we saw in 2.1 a lot easier. Um, in this case, we're trying to find the points on the graph of negative x cubed plus 6x squared, at which the tangent line is horizontal. So I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit, and theoretically we would be doing this problem without a calculator, uh, but I'm going to cheat, take a look at the graph of this, and you'll notice that we have two points on the graph where we have a horizontal tangent. Um, at x equals 0, we have a slope of 0, which would be a horizontal tangent, and at x equals 4, we again have a slope of 0 for our horizontal tangent.
So, slope being the key word, we gotta first find a derivative, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, anytime you think of that word slope in calculus, you should be thinking we need a derivative. So, uh, let's go ahead and take that derivative. Uh, all I did in this first step here was just color coded using the color coding I've been using, and then I went ahead and drew that uh, one in front of the x cubed just to emphasize the pieces that we're looking at here. So, we have two different functions. We have a function in this first term we have a function in the second term that are being added uh, so we can use that sum difference rule I'm going to take the derivatives of these two functions separately so for the first function uh, I'm going to leave the negative 1 in the front and then use the power rule on x cubed bring the 3 down reduce the power by 1 for the second function I'm going to leave the 6 in the front bring the power of 2 down reduce the power on x by 1 and again this is our derivative so we got to put f prime uh, when you simplify all, all that, uh, we'll get a derivative, a slope producing machine of negative 3x squared plus 12x. So there's many things we can do with this derivative, this slope producing machine. I can find the slope at certain points on our function. Um, I can find an equation of a tangent line, which would, we'd need to find the slope first. Uh, but in this particular problem, we want to find where we have a slope of 0. So what are we going to have to do? Well, we know our slope, our m is equal to 0, and you have to remember that this is slope. f prime of x, which is a derivative, is another way of saying slope. So since we know our slope is 0, we're going to plug in 0 for f prime of x, so we can solve for the x values where the derivative, or the slope, is 0. Uh, this really just comes down to a nice simple little algebra problem to solve for x. You'll notice both terms have a 3, a negative 3x in common, or I'm going to factor out a negative 3x. When you factor out a negative 3x from the first term, we're left with x. When you factor a negative 3x out from the second term, we're left with negative uh, 4. And since we have two things being multiplied equal to 0, we can set each of those factors equal to 0. We can set negative 3x equal to 0, and we can set x minus 4 equal to 0. Of course, both of those are nice and easy to solve. We can see that x equals 0 and x equals 4, just like you saw in the picture at the beginning of this problem. Uh, we have a horizontal tangent at 0, and we have a horizontal tangent at 4. So luckily that all worked out. Uh, but be careful. Um, this problem asked us to find the points where we have a horizontal tangent. Um, we don't have the y values, so just a little bit further so we can finalize this problem. When x equals 0 and when x equals 4, we got to find the corresponding y values. Luckily, we have our function machine here. We have the function, which again, if you feed it an x value, it'll spit out a y value. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in both of our x values into the function. Um, when we plug in 0, we find that the y value is 0, and we can see that on the graph. And when we plug in 4, you can see that our y value is 32, and again, you can kind of tell that from the graph. So I'm going to go ahead and finalize this problem by writing out a, a little statement, but you can see the two points right there, 0, 0, and 4, comma, 32. Um, kind of write out a statement to finalize this graph. We can say, after all this analysis, thus, the tangent line to the graph is horizontal at the points 0, 0, and 4, comma, 32.